This is episode 102 of Stand Up, where each and every episode I reach out to my expert friends and have conversations about the important issues that matter to you, your family, your community, and your planet. Joining me today, Boston Globe columnist Michael Cohen, anti-racist speaker and writer Tim Wise, and I reached out to three high school seniors in my community in Rockland County at Clarkstown North High School and had a conversation with them about what it's like to have half of your senior year canceled. I'm Pete Dominic. Stand up with me right now. Hey, guys. Happy Monday. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're listening on Monday, I know podcasts don't really have a date in mind, but some of you listen every day. Some listen to the podcast when you can or to the guests that you like the most or that intrigue you. But every day I put out as much content as I can all over the place in hopes that you'll find something that you will like and want to subscribe to. Doing it daily. All of the subscriptions matter, and so many of you now subscribing uh, with paid subscriptions on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. And a quick shout out to new subscribers. Connie Guess, five bucks. Donald Johnson, five dollars. Ten dollars for Mike Stevens. Mark Addy is paying five bucks. Hey, Mark, long time no here. Five dollars from Jonathan McGrath. Ten dollars, Leonard Barry. Five dollars from Daniel Gomez. Michael Todd just edited his pledge from twenty-five to fifty dollars a month. Thank you, Michael. Five dollars from Michael O'Haggerty. Ten dollars subscription from Greg Stoop. Ten dollars subscription from Michael Green. Randolph edited his pledge from ten to fifteen dollars. Seven dollars. I didn't know you could do seven dollars from Bruce Hale. Jeff Bogan edited his pledge. Every month from ten to twenty dollars, five dollars from Jennifer Trippiani De Trippiani De Trappini. Sorry, Jennifer, I'll get that name right. Thank you very much. Joel Hogan signed up for a five dollar subscription. Stapler Vacuum signed up for a ten dollar subscription. Twenty five dollar subscription from Elaine Miller. Dan Marino just edited his pledge to ten dollars and a five dollar subscription from Del Ray Whitley. Welcome to all of the new subscribers to Stand Up with Me, Dominic. To this amazing, passionate, curious intellectual, intelligent, same word, hilarious community of human beings. Welcome one, welcome all to the Stand Up with Pete Dominic community. I'm so excited to have all of you joining us, and I look forward to hearing all of your feedback, your ideas, your criticism, your suggestions, and coming together as a community to figure out solutions for our problems. Welcome. I am so inspired. After 100 episodes last week, I welcomed a whole bunch of guests on the air, and I want to continue welcoming you as a guest on the show, all kinds of different topics and subjects that you're experts on. I'd love to hear from you. So let's get to know each other even more, and let's get to 1,000, 2,000, 300 subscribers. Did I just say 1,000, 2,300 Subscribers, I did. I'm not editing it out. I don't like to edit out the mess ups and the mix ups like that because I'm a human being and I make mistakes. Bottom line is, I am so excited to have this independent media outlet that you are supporting with a paid subscription. Tell your friends. And if you aren't yet, sign up right now. Go to the paid subscription link on the show notes or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Okay. Ooh, I hope you had a good weekend. I hope that you had a good Mother's Day, if that's a thing that you celebrate. I, Friday night, had a fine time sitting down and watching Michelle Obama's Netflix called Becoming. I really enjoyed that. I highly recommend it. I wish it would have gotten even deeper into her own personal insecurities and misgivings while she was the first lady. But I understand she probably wants to keep some of that privacy to herself forever. Made me want to read her book as well. I'm a big Michelle Obama fan. Say anything bad about her and I will come for you. On Saturday, I got drunk. That's right. I don't really ever drink too much and I wouldn't do it on purpose, but I ended up drinking a little bit too much wine. I was sitting out by a bonfire that I made for myself again the second Saturday in a row. There I was drinking away when my neighbors, who I never talked to, really, they're nice enough. I mean, I, nice, fine. I have no problems with them, but I don't really touch them. They came over. And said, we saw your fire. Can we drink with you? And I ended up hanging out with my neighbors for a little while. And then when that was over, I went inside and I was like, oh, my God, I'm kind of drunk. 
And then I just fell asleep because that's what I do. Anyway, I had a great weekend. I hope that you did as well. All kinds of crazy shit happened in the world. And it's time to get back to work. Time to figure out what is what here on a Monday. And here are the details where we're at in the United States of America. More than 1.3 million people in our country have been infected. 78,700 have died of COVID-19. And New York Times analysis found that nearly a third of those deaths were linked to long-term care homes for older adults. Uh, That is uh, on the health front, on the sickness and death front. And on the economy, the U.S. has now lost 20 million jobs. A wrong move by lawmakers could turn temporary layoffs into permanent job loss. Economists, both liberal and conservative, are warning that ending aid to businesses and workers without a new strategy could result in partial recoveries, rising infection rates, and insufficient support for businesses and the unemployed. The unemployment rate now, 14.7%, hitting nearly every sector of the labor market. That means barely more than half the adult population in the U.S. now has a job. Let me know what your job situation is, your financial situation is. I'm going to be doing an upcoming episode on that, talking to people about their predicament, their situation. And I'd really like to try to tell your story here on the podcast, which I'm doing every single day. So let's get to it. My first guest here on a Monday are three high school seniors from Clarkstown North High School. They are in Rockland County, New York. They're all off to college next year. But I thought it would be interesting to reach out and speak with high school seniors about what it was like to have half of their school year, I would argue the better half canceled. And so I just put some straight up questions to them to kind of get their perspective. And I was happy that they agreed to do it and that it wasn't weird, but I'm going to keep checking in with these young people, I think, and other young people as well. If you have a high school senior yourself or a child that is in any way interesting and unique and would want to talk to me about any number of issues, I'd be happy to talk to your kid as well. So send them my way. That sounded creepy. Send your kids my way. Anyway, here's my conversation with Rosie, Jordan, and Emily from Clarkstown North in Rockland County, New York. Hey, guys, thank you very much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. No problem, no problem. Yeah, sure. Uh, All right. So I was thinking about my senior year, and it was a long time ago. I'm 44, but I still remember it. I remember a lot about high school. I enjoyed high school. And I really look forward to senior year. You hear about senior year, all of high school. You guys got to have about half of your senior year. You got a taste of it. But I'll go to you first, Jordan. What was that first half like? Was it the better half? Or would you have preferred, if you had a choice, to have the the spring semester? Um, I think we did have a pretty good first half of school, but... There is a lot of stuff that we're going to be missing out on, such as in-person graduation, prom, and many other activities that were planned for us. So it's kind of disheartening. What about you, Rosie? Did you get a taste of your senior year that you had probably, I'm just assuming, been anticipating, certainly all of high school? Did you get a good enough taste of it to know what it was like? Did you make new friends? Did you have some experiences good, hopefully, in that first half of the year? Yeah, definitely. We still got a good like I still will leave with good memories because of football season and everything. But I was talking with friends a couple of days ago and they said that they would rather this have happened in the fall because the spring is just more exciting with the last three months, like the last hurrah. Same question for you, Emily. I mean, you had uh, some taste of your senior year. How was it? Um, Yeah, the fall was really fun, like with football games and like we had a lot of senior events. Um, but I do wish like we had the spring instead, just because like we've already been accepted to college and like, we know where everyone's going. It's just really exciting. It seems like guys like the second half of senior year is the phone it in, totally have a great time, hang out. Is that the generally the case at your high schools? It is a lot of high schools across America certainly was when I was growing up, but that was in the dark ages. (laughs) Emily, is that like, is the second half of the year, at least the last month really kind of party time? Um, I guess, yeah, just because, like, school isn't really, like, a huge pressure anymore. Plus, like, throughout senior year, we've been waiting for, like, that last month because there's so much going on with prom and graduation and even, like, skip days and just, like, our last day of school. So what are you guys all missing individually? Because it would strike me that, the you know, 
Jordan, you mentioned a couple of the events, commencement and and prom, but you know, I know Emily well enough to know that she's on the dance team and during football. But what did you what did you have in your fall semester? What experiences? What teams? What activities? What extracurriculars? And what are you what are you missing on those types of experiences in terms of actual teams or seasons, Rosie? So I did get to experience my last season of the dance team with Emily. We're on it together. So that was definitely, I'm happy that we got to do that. But then we're missing our dance recitals at our dance studio. And also I was supposed to be doing my final community theater performance. And that just got canceled yesterday over the summer. I'm sorry to hear that. What about you, Jordan? Um, So I actually, my baseball season just recently got canceled and up to that point, we were practicing like three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, just prepping for it. And next thing you know, in the middle of tryouts, we're told that we're all from school and now we're not going back. So it's very sad. What's that like? Uh, well, let me ask you the same question, Emily. What are you, are, are you, uh, do you usually do an activity, a team in the spring? Um, the spring isn't too busy for me, but I mean, like Rosie said, like we had like our end of year uh, dance recital. So I guess I'm missing out on that, which sucks, but it's also just like a time to like go to a lot of events, like Jordan said, like baseball games and lacrosse games and all that. How do you guys, how, how did you feel if that's a question you can answer emotionally when when school got canceled were you scared that you're going to get sick or your loved ones was it a lot about that was it sad that you were going to miss out on all of these things and obviously I'll, and I'm going to get to how you guys have been able to socialize but how did you feel it's a feelings question when you know emotional question when they announced that school was over and probably for good Jordan um I was just like in complete shock. Like I remember I wake up and I look at the time and I, all of a sudden my mom comes in and she's like, you're off from school because of coronavirus. And I was just like, wow, this is like actually hitting us when we didn't believe it was going to. Were you sad? Were you happy? Was I was that, just like is, full of emotions. Mixed? Like I thought we were going to be off school for like two weeks. I'm like, okay, it's not that bad. We get a little break, but then next thing you know, we just get more extensions of no school. And now it's really sad because we don't get to see our friends in real, like real in person. What would you add, Emily? How did, how did you find out? How did you feel? Honestly, when like we first found out, um, I was just kind of like, I guess like we didn't really expect it to go on for this long. Like I expected it to affect us in some way, but I just didn't think it would be this long. And then as like, we started talking more and I realized like, the rest of my senior year might not even happen. That's when I got really upset because I feel like I took the last little bit for granted, not knowing we would have the rest of senior year. Ah, uh, uh, that's so rough. This whole thing, my heart goes out to you guys so much. I really, that's why I wanted to do this with, with some high school seniors. And if folks listening have a son or daughter uh, or somebody, I guess, who doesn't identify gender, anybody who is a senior that wants to join this conversation, I'll do it again for sure. Rosie, what about you? How did you find out? Were you, how did you feel? Um, I was just, I was actually like in the middle of doing yoga. I was doing like a meditation <laughs> type thing. So I was feeling really good that day. And then I checked my phone right after, and then I found out. And to be honest, I was just kind of like heartbroken Because as Emily said, I felt like I just took my year for granted. And I was like, oh, I hate school. I don't want to go back. And then now that it's over, I'm like, I want to go back. I wish I could just finish the rest of senior year. Has there been, guys, anything that's been great about this that you would say? Any silver linings, anything you, you didn't expect that you are happy about? Anybody? Um. Well, I feel like during this time like these past like two to three months have been like a growing process. I feel like I've like been able to get more mature and like learn more about myself that I didn't know previously. So how how did you do that? I mean, why, why aren't I'm, I'm interested in how that happens when you're isolated versus with your friends. I mean, aren't you just chilling out, read, you know, watching shows and playing video games when you say that you matured and got to know yourself, is there anything in particular experience or relationship so, yeah. with your family or something? Um, so like during the school year, I'll just, it was either sports school. And then on the weekends, we'll hang out with friends. But now that we're just by ourselves or with our family, we're like more grateful for these moments, like hanging out with our family. We don't take for granted anymore. And 
just maturing as a person overall, like doing things independently and individually and dealing with the whole college process. It makes you like really grow as a person. Was I right? Uh, like real quick, just uh, as a departure, how do you generally spend your days? Are, uh, do you, are you in front of a screen a lot? Do you go outside a lot? I mean, do you have a, are you really regimented Jordan on your schedule or anything like that? Uh, well, we're definitely starting to get up a little later than what we would normally get up at. And instead of like being in person learning now we're it's all technology. We type our work, hand in our work online, take pictures of our work to turn it online. And it's tough to go outside now because you're scared that you may get the coronavirus. So you have to remember. Just like going out in your lawn even? Um, I feel like going out on your lawn in your neighborhood isn't as bad as like going on the main roads in our town. So right. it's a little different. Uh, Emily, Rosie, any, uh, any silver linings? Same question that I asked Jordan. Like any, anything you would add to what he said about you know, maturing and getting close with family, either of you want to answer? Um, I'm a lot closer with my family now. I mean, sometimes too close, but <laughs> um, I also feel like I'm doing things I probably wouldn't have done before. Like I read a book the other day, like that was new. <laughs> I also know that like, honestly, there's a lot of people that are really struggling with this. Like, I don't think that I'm hit the hardest with it. I know there's so many families and just like people that have lost jobs and are financially struggling. And so I don't want to think like I hit the blunt with everything um so yeah it also helps that like everyone is in this like it's not just me like right my like like every high school senior is basically feeling the same way right right well it's good that you have that perspective about that it could be worse but still this is your experience it's your senior year and you can obviously still feel your feelings about about this but i i, I, I that's thoughtful and i appreciate that you, you saying that uh rosie any uh, any silver linings for you? Any any good things coming out of this? Um, so me and my family actually just before we so my two brothers play guitar and I sing and we kind of just sit out on our deck and we just sing and jam out. So that's really fun. So I feel like we've oh, been that's a lot closer. That's really really cool. Do you post those anywhere? Um, I recently posted a singing video on Facebook just of me singing somewhere over the rainbow, but we've been taking videos. We just haven't posted them anywhere. We're a little iffy at the moment. Huh. Uh, uh, well, fair enough, but I, I'm totally blown away that you post on Facebook. I thought <laughs> that teenagers and high school seniors did not use Facebook. Emily, Jordan, do you guys, are you guys also on Facebook or is it? I don't know how to use Facebook. Like I kind of do <laughs> like, so I'm like getting used to it. Cause we have like these group chats now, but. Yep. Sometimes I'm like so lost. I don't know. What about you, Jordan? Um, I've been using Facebook mainly for joining certain, well, before I joined a college, joining certain college like groups. And that way you're able to like right. find certain people and make roommates and friends before you huh. go off to college. All right. Uh, yeah. Speaking of which, you guys are all off to college. Emily, you're going to North Carolina to go to Elon, right? Rosie, you're going upstate New York, outside Syracuse State University of New York at Cortland. Mm -hmm. And Jordan, you're going out to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Is that right? So um, same question for all three of you. How much correspondent have you had with your school in terms of them planning on having a, a quote, normal fall semester? Emily, have you been are they planning? Do you do you have is it all uncertain still? Um, some of it is still uncertain, but I think that they are making preparations in case like should this continue to go on? Um, it's also like a private school, so it's like they, they really need a lot of students to come. They can't depend on the state. So I think they're just making preparations and kind of a plan if another like wave hits, um, like especially when we're there, too. But like, I think they're still planning right. on us going back in the fall. Rosie, Jordan, what about you? What do you hear from your schools? Similar? I think they're still planning on it. They said they just pushed back the in-person orientation a couple days but so far they're planning on having things in person, but we've been doing, they've been doing WebEx calls where they just give us information on different things. Same thing, Jordan. Oh uh, yeah. Like a couple of weeks ago, Michigan had a zoom call for a lot of their admitted students, just giving them information, updating them on the situation that we have like right now. So. How have your families been in terms of, you know, I, 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 my heart goes out to you. I feel bad for you. But my daughters are in ninth and, and sixth grade, which aren't particularly significant years per se. But I've been thinking a lot about what it would be like if 
my daughters were seniors and how I would want to try to do something to help, quote, normalize it or, or, or give them experiences. If, have your families and has the community and your friends like done anything to try to uh, uh, to celebrate you, to give you experiences that you wouldn't have had, but are still, is there anything like that going? Anybody? Um, so our, like my family, like we try to have like some sort of like movie night, like a couple mm-hmm. times a week, just to like sit down and bring us together. And also many of our friends, we actually have a Facebook thing and an Instagram thing where we announce our college decisions. And it's a great way for people to know where we're going and interacting with each other and congratulating each other. Uh, what about you guys, Emily, Rosie, your, your parents do anything? Is there a senior, I'm a senior like sign in your front lawn. Is everybody doing that? Yeah. My mom put one up in my front lawn and basically every day we've just been cooking and baking. I forced them to watch Disney movies with me. So we've been trying to watch all the Disney movies over again. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> what about you, Emily? Yeah, same here. Um, I don't have a sign cause I live on a dead end, but oh. we've been like, like <laughs> when I committed to Elon, they did, um, kind of like a celebration in my like living room like we had cookie cake and balloons and we ordered like apparel so there's ways to like really get excited and like jordan said like there's a facebook and an instagram so like it's fun to see where everyone else is going to do you think that they'll have some kind of like commencement and prom post you know this year maybe even next year some kind of similar ceremony so your experience you know you don't lose that experience is there is there talk of anything like that yeah, they're trying to do, um, they're trying to figure out plans for graduation at the moment, whether it's going to be like at the football field and it's just seniors or it's going to be virtual, you don't really know. And as far as prom goes, I'm not really sure if they're just pushing it back or if we're going to find another way to have prom, but they are trying. Uh, what about anything else that you guys feel like you've missed out on that I haven't asked, you know, something that I wouldn't even think of that you're doing. Is there anything else that that's that you think people would want to know about your high school, half of your senior year, the second half being canceled? Any, any, any other thoughts or feelings about it that, that are really difficult or challenging or surprising for those of us that can't relate? Um, well, I know a lot of other high, high schools have like a certain type of tournament that goes on in like the winter and spring. And we actually have a volleyball tournament in our gym classes. And it's kind of like a March Madness bracket with like 64 teams. And then the final two actually like compete in front of the whole school. And Uh, we were just in the middle and we were like about to reach playoffs. So, Oh, there's something. Yeah. What about you guys, Emily, Rosie, anything else that you're, you're missing out on or that didn't get mentioned? Yeah. Like Jordan said, just like the small things that are like part of senior year that you don't really like, pay attention to in the moment but like looking back like i don't know like just certain classes that are really fun and like you're not going to see those people again but yeah yeah Yeah, just treasuring the moments like the last moments that you have with your friends before you're like three hours away from them and you can't see them every single day right right what about finally how are how are you guys hanging out right now like what is it like tell all of us old fogies how teenagers seniors in high school in this case socialize like my my daughter is actually watching like marathons of shows and movies with a friend or friends like just on the phone and they just sit there and watch and i guess they talk at some i don't know but they're having that kind of a shared experience while on the phone what are you guys doing to socialize you're what 17 18 i would think you really are close with your friends and 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 want to be with them and talk to them and and even you know going on dates and stuff what do you do to socialize to make up for it? Um, we've been doing Zoom calls. Oh, Emily, you can go. Oh, yeah. We're just been doing like Zoom calls once a week, if not more. Um, sometimes we like when it's nice out, we'll go to a parking lot and park like far away from each other and just sit in the trunks and talk. So, wow. You just park your cars and sit in your trunk? Yeah, basically. <laughs> it's just a way to talk like in person. It's just weird, though, at first. Yeah, I'm sure. What is weird about it that you just I mean, I, I haven't really even done that with adults, uh, not not in a group, <laughs> but you just I don't know how, how you describe it. If we just weird. Uh, what else? Um, how else do you guys socialize? Jordan, do you do uh, how do how do guys talk? Uh, we generalizing actually about do guys. the same thing where we sit in our cars at like a certain area and we just talk for a while or 
we do Zoom calls or we usually go on like Xbox at night and like talk there because it's a great way to bring people together. So you, you'll be playing a, a game and talking? Yeah, pretty much. And are guys just like shit talking each other and or talking about whatever during the game or is it just about the game? Uh, it, it varies sometimes. Sometimes we'll be like going crazy and the other times we'll be like calm and just talking about life. Uh, what about you, Rosie? How, how have you, anything that you would add? Are you doing similar things? Have you uh, sat in the trunk of your car? Yeah. We, I went to a couple parking lots and mostly just FaceTiming people and playing games on Zoom. That's fun. Uh, what is that? Playing games on Zoom? What do you mean? Oh, oh, you, while you're on Zoom playing a video game or something? No, we play this thing. It's kind of like a Kahoot type thing where it gives you prompts and then you answer it. And Emily, I don't really know how to describe it. It's really oh, hard to describe, but it's really fun. Like it's through Zoom, like someone's a host and they give you like all these questions and you answer based on like your group. Like it's a lot of like inside jokes, I guess, but it's fun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And so you you can go on and play those types of games and have like an activity to be on Zoom around and have a ton of laughs and it's yeah. fun. Mm-hmm. Um. All right, guys. Well. I mean, let me just ask you one more question. I don't want to get too personal, but has has it gotten like dark for you? Have you gotten have you gotten real down at times? And how do you how do you deal with that? Or or have you heard if you don't maybe want to talk about yourself, like any friends like dealing with? I mean, there's a lot of serious mental health issues, period. As adolescents, you know, you're going through this crazy transition now. How how are you? Have you had some some harder times, Rosie? Um, Definitely, because every day is just monotonous it's like you wake up you eat you do your schoolwork, and there's nothing really to look forward to it's such a bad thing to think about but I try to remain positive but then sometimes I just slip and I'm like what is there to like look forward to like everything that I was looking forward to doing is gone now what about you Jordan have you had uh do you, do you get bored sad depressed yeah, it's dark? a little tough I actually um, look forward to some of the Zoom calls that our teachers have because, like, we get to see our friends' faces and our teachers' faces, and it's just fun to talk to them at times. Do you mess around, by the way, during those? Aren't you? Aren't you? Like, that's going to be an interesting opportunity to just message your friends with your phone. Something you can't do when you're sitting in class, right? Mm-hmm. And like, oh, I can't believe you just said that, or just trashing each other, whatever the hell you guys do. Are you constantly like? It must be tough for the teacher when you guys are all talking <laughs> with each other while the teacher thinks you might be possibly paying attention. Yeah. It's yeah. usually just a lot of laughing. I know. How can I I'd be sitting here teaching about some boring subject and I'm looking at the class and everybody's laughing. and I'm the only one not in it as a comedian. That is even terrible. Yeah. Uh, they're not laughing at me. Emily, what about you? How have you uh, have you had some down times? Uh, yeah, it's tough, especially when it like when it's raining or like I can't really go outside and just like get some fresh air. That's when like those days are really the worst. Um, I just try to like watch movies. Um, but yeah, like Rose and Jordan said, it's weird. It's just kind of like the same thing every day. So it just it gets old. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Well, guys, I'll let you go. And I appreciate you doing this with me and answering all my questions. Great job. I wish you all the best of luck. And if you don't mind, maybe I'll uh, I'll reach out again, maybe as uh, as school hopefully starts in the fall and we can get together again. And and, uh, and then we'll just check at, in with each other, the four of us, for the rest of your lives, like once a year. Sound good? That's pretty good. Thank you. We'll just motivate each other. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Sure. Bye. Thank all you right, again. guys. Bye. All right, wasn't that nice of them? Weren't they smart kids? Didn't they give you faith and hope in the future? Emily and Rosie and Jordan. I know Emily because she is a daughter of friends of ours here, and she put this together and invited Rosie and Jordan. So big shout out and thank you to Emily Simmons, as well as to Rosie and Jordan and their parents for allowing me to interview them. I hope that you share that with your friends. You guys did a great job. It was super interesting to hear your answers to those questions. All right. Now I sit down with Tim Wise, who I try to catch up with basically every week. I think he is one of the smartest, sharpest, most fearless commentators out there. He's an anti-racist speaker and author and usually travels the country speaking. But he's been publishing his content, as we all have online now, mostly at Medium. And you should read everything and subscribe to everything and support him on Patreon. Here's my conversation now with Tim Wise. All right, I've got Tim Wise right now. You've got to read his new piece. 
at Medium, where he is publishing articles. Follow him on Twitter at Tim Jacob Wise, and you should listen to his commentary and support him on Patreon because normally, Tim, you're traveling around the country doing speeches, but like the rest of us, no travel yeah. and no live speaking. So you're publishing your commentary right. online, right? Right. Yes. All right. Those are all the right places to find it. Uh, really important Medium piece that I want to talk about. Uh, but I also want to talk with you about what happened down in Georgia with this uh, horrific killing of the of young man who is jogging. You've been reacting to that. We've seen these uh, things happen over and over. Um, how are we supposed to look at this latest one? And, you know, you don't want to jump to conclusions, but man, we saw this video and all hell broke loose. Right. Well, I mean, and that's the thing. If there weren't a video, nothing would be happening in this case. Uh, the two men who were involved in killing Ahmad Arbery would be free. No one would know what had happened. Um, and, you know, it almost went down that way anyway. I mean, there were two district attorneys that recused themselves, one of which said, oh, there's no crime committed here uh, because these two men thought that Ahmad Arbery was a burglar. Of course, two things important, right? Number one, they had no probable cause to believe that. Uh, he was jogging down the neighborhood, through the neighborhood. He was not acting suspicious. He's walking around in a construction site. I have done that on my own block within the last two months, probably a house that was being built, never once would have thought that someone was going to see me and assume that I was a burglar. Did that when I was a younger person would walk around construction sites, would sit around and drink and smoke weed at construction. Oh, I'll, site. Like I'll, that was, I'll upgrade you, know. you. We would go, we would go to houses that were being built. We would steal the fucking lumber and build skateboarding right, ramps. Right. Steal. We would steal, that, but I, I could have, but I could have because nobody would have thought twice. Yeah. So number one, they had no real probable cause. Number two, now we know the local officials, the police have said, actually, there haven't been any burglaries except for one robbery out of like the car, the unlocked car of the guys who actually shot him. I guess somebody took a gun. And then there was one other guy that had some fishing equipment stolen, but we have no idea who did that. There's no evidence that Ahmaud Arbery did. Uh, and so it, all in all, the story doesn't fit. But what does fit, is this is in keeping with a longstanding tradition of white men believing they have the right to police black bodies, whether or not they're police officers. This is not just, you know, this is someone who has connections to cops, but is not currently in law enforcement and yet believes it's like, hey, son, grab your gun. Let's get in the truck and go. Let's fire it up. We got to go confront this guy. This all stems back to a mentality, not only a Southern mentality, though those of us in the South are very familiar with it, a mentality that says we have the right to do citizens arrest, to just simply go out and stop people on suspicion. That traces back to a period of enslavement and Jim Crow segregation. And as is so often the case in that history, it ends up with this horrible, tragic murder. Um, and I think it just, again, goes to show that that in this era where everyone's telling us uh, from on high that, oh, we're all in this together and COVID is the great equalizer and, and how we have to pull together as a nation, that we still have these ongoing divisions that a coronavirus pandemic has certainly not solved. And all it does is really expose the extent to which some life still is valued far less than other life. Well, you also have what plays what's playing out now. It always seems to play out is the uh, he was no angel uh, narrative. And they dig deep in the victim's past and find out anything they might have been accused of or done. And we've seen this over and over and over with all of these victims, not all of them, but often in this case, apparently uh, people are saying, well, he one point he brought a gun to school it you know but tim it doesn't matter does it it doesn't matter no matter anything that they had done in the past how do you describe that kind of tactic that you see playing out in the media and even the defenders of these two vigilantes well he did this he did that in the past what is that how is that relevant at all and why is that well, happen well, OK, he brought a gun to school. Very true. When he was in high school, uh, there was a kid named Andy Williams in Santee, California, that brought a gun to school back in 2001 and actually used it and shot people. And the police managed to come get him and not shoot him, not kill him. So the fact that somebody brought a gun to school doesn't justify their being shot. And when they're white, they don't get shot. They might kill themselves, but they're usually not finished off by law enforcement or by a vigilante or anyone else who decides to draw on them. Second thing is that according to the National Center for Education Statistics data, which I posted on Twitter uh, just yesterday, white folks are more likely 
than black folks to bring a weapon, including a gun, equally likely to bring a gun, more likely to bring some kind of weapon onto school grounds. But this kind of shit doesn't happen to us. So what it suggests to me is that this rationalization is all post facto, post hoc rationalization, because we've decided if this guy did anything wrong in his past, even though all of us or most all of us have done lots of wrong things in our past, that that can then be used after the fact to justify what happens to them five years later, 10 years later, 15 years years later, 20 years later, you know, ad infinitum. But with white folks, we don't do that. We would not justify five years later, a white kid being shot by vigilantes or by police, because once upon a time, he brought a gun to school and didn't even use it in the commission of a crime. Didn't, didn't, hold anybody up, didn't rob anyone, didn't shoot anyone, brought it to school, got arrested for that, was put on probation, as I understand. But that has nothing to do with the current situation, except for those people who will always look for rationalizations for anything that happens to black people at the hands of white people, which is to say rationalizations by white people and Candace Owens. That's about. Yeah, I was I was just reading that, uh, but I I wasn't even going to bring it up. But you just did. What did she do? You know what she said? Uh, I can't even reference. Yeah, I mean, She posted something. She posted. Well, actually, she posted a bunch of stuff. The only source that I could find of which was 4chan and Reddit. You uh, know, very, very uh, prized journalism they do over at 4chan, where basically the allegation was that he had broken into a house, was caught on video. His mother identified him as the person who was breaking in on video. None of that is correct. The only video is one of him going into the construction site. He did not steal anything. He was not burglarizing the home. The mother identified him on that video, not a separate video where he was stealing something. Candace also uh, misidentified the owner of the home. The person she identified was the guy who had fishing equipment stolen in a totally different event for which he has no evidence that Ahmad Arbery was involved. But Candace Owens doesn't give a damn, nor do the white people who pay her handsomely give a damn about the truth in this matter. I don't think there's a single black person who has died at the hands of white people that folks like that ever, ever believe died unjustly. They will never uh, actually hold white people accountable for those murders, and they will always and forever dig into the past of those individuals uh, to try to rationalize after the fact what was done. And you could see on the Twitter thread under her comments how many of her followers were like, oh, so good to have you back, Candace. So good uh, to have you back, and thank you for, for bringing the truth to this situation because they're just looking for a black person right. to rationalize their anti-black bias. And once they find one, whether it's Candace Owens, whether it's, you know, Clarence Thomas, whether it's Thomas Sowell, whether it's Terrence K. Williams, who was always and uh, forever having his life threatened on Twitter uh, and then grifting white people to send him money. Yeah. Right? White folks will always look for a black face to justify our bullshit. But let's be clear. It's our bullshit. Tim Wise, what about the idea that this kid now has been the rather the uh, the shooters in this case have both been arrested? Uh, so it seems like, you know, we're headed in the right direction. But how do you look at this in terms of, well, the arrests happened to these two vigilantes. But what about a trial? In the past, we've seen similar videos where it looked very bad and somehow they get away with it. And then the rage sure. that we see is is uh, inevitable. Right. Well, I mean, it, that's the problem there. There can be an arrest. Uh, there can be an indictment. There can be a trial. But that doesn't mean there's going to be a conviction uh, in spite of the fact that if you really read the Georgia law uh, that allows for, quote unquote, citizens arrest, these guys didn't actually you know, follow that law. There are things about the probable cause necessary in, the, in those cases, which this does not fit. So right. really, they should be convicted of something. Now, what that ends up being, I don't know. But the idea that they should be able to go scot free uh, is an absolute perversion of justice. And yet we know that it happens. Bernard Getz was arrested, but he was only ultimately found guilty of, you know, possession of a, a weapon that he wasn't supposed to have back in 1984 in New York. Uh, others have obviously been let free, George Zimmerman and others. So we don't have any idea what's going to happen. But we do know that the machinations of American justice tend to work against the interest of people like Ahmaud Arbery and in favor of the interest of white guys like these two guys involved in this case, one of whom has very direct ties to law enforcement. So what's going to happen when, when they are tried by a jury of their peers? Who are their peers? Their peers are people who were raised on the same anti-Black bias, the same anti-Black bigotry, the same fear and scapegoating uh, that all of white America was raised with. So I have, I, I'm going to continue to hope, but it may be hoping against hope that, that the right thing is done in this case because they need to be held accountable for what they did. There's no excuse. 
I don't know what the numbers are in terms of rise in, in hate crimes. I was thinking the other day, t- uh, Tim, about how long it has been since we have seen any type of terrorist attack coming from someone who is, you know, uh, 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 religious uh, in terms of any Muslims. We just haven't seen any any that that kind of Al Qaeda jihadist terrorist attack or even attempts in the United States of America. As much as they are digging for them, we it's just not happening. However, what we do see is a specific kind of terrorism uh, that we can easily call white supremacy. And the fact that that is continuing on and it's given cover by a whole bunch of people in media and obviously the president, how much worse has it gotten in the past three years? And and do you ever think, as, as I am, about how, how rare it is that we have a terrorist attack being perpetrated by a person of color versus white people? Well, I think about that part all the time. I mean, I've actually compiled, I did a piece that's actually among my essays at Medium, where I talk about the face of terrorism being white. And I go through this litany of cases going back maybe 20 years Mm. of all the terrorists. And I name all the different terrorists who have attacked in this country who were white and claimed to be Christian. Now, whether they were obviously a whole different issue, right? But claimed to be. And it's like 120 deep. And I didn't even include them all. I mean, I think I stopped as of like maybe three or four years ago. And so what is that? And most of those names you wouldn't recognize. I mean, a few of them you would, Tim McVeigh, Terry Nichols, things like that. Yeah. But most of them would be names that, that you haven't heard of. And these were abortion clinic bombers or the murderers of abortion doctors. These were people who bombed mosques or synagogues or shot Jews, you know, walking out of the synagogue. These were people who, who flew planes into the IRS building in Austin, Texas, a few years ago. We're talking about people who have engaged in bombing, uh, targeted assassination, arsons. And most of them we haven't heard anything of. What does that tell us, right? It tells us that we've racialized fear and we've and we've Islamized fear uh, in a way that really isn't just bigoted. I mean, that's the least of the problems. The bigger problem is it makes us less safe because we're spending so much time looking for danger over there that we're ignoring the danger that's right here. So that's the first piece. As far as the hate crime stuff, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I know that in the first you know, 18 months to two years after Donald Trump was elected, there was certainly a spike in hate activity against Latinx folks in particular because of the anti-immigrant bias and anti-Muslim bias. And of course, just in the last few months, there had been a pretty substantial, I want to say it was like 20%, 30% increase in the amount of anti-Asian bias as a result of the racialization of coronavirus, right. the anti-Chinese rhetoric, the you know Chinese flu, Wuhan flu rhetoric. And I'm not sure what those numbers say now, since that is sort of receded a bit as the narrative. It's still out there, but it's less than it was at the beginning. But all that tells you that this stuff, you know, filters from the top down. And when people hear this kind of stuff, there are stories of young kids. I'm talking kindergartners. I'm talking third graders who are telling classmates, you know, Donald Trump is going to send you out of the country or you be at an eighth grade basketball game. And maybe it's a school that's mostly white playing a team that's mostly maybe Latino kids. And they're saying, you know, build the wall, build the wall. Where's that coming from? Well, it might be coming from home, but even that is coming from home because of what's coming from the president. So I don't want to suggest that the president's responsible for all of it. Some of this stuff is in the soil and the DNA and the soul of the nation. It's not just him, right? He just reactivated it in a way, Uh, but it's always there. And it's the kind of thing that until we decide that we've had enough of it, we're going to continue to see welling up like this. So your piece uh, posted on May 10th that medium is a real scorcher. I mean, uh, you you never hold back, Tim, but this is this is something I actually tried to be more critical of this than I usually am of of your stuff. But the more I thought about it, the arguments you're making, uh, the more accurate they seem to be. It's titled it's not a death cult. It's a mass murder movement. MAGA Nation isn't looking to sacrifice itself, but will gladly sacrifice others juxtaposed this cult, the Trump cult with the Jim Jones or the David Koresh cults. Right. Well, see, for a long time, I've even said, many of us have, right, that that conservatism under Trump was becoming something of a death cult, that MAGA nation was a death cult. And especially when you had these folks like, you know, um, uh, Governor Abbott in Texas and Lieutenant Governor Patrick saying that, you know, it's worth dying to keep the economy moving or Glenn Beck saying, I'll be willing to die for my grandchildren or whatever. Right. It sort of sounds like, oh, my God, these folks are ready to line up and take the Kool-Aid. But here's the thing. And I've even said it. But I started rethinking it because if you really listen to these folks, a couple things jump out at you. Number one, they don't really think they're going to die, do they? I mean, when you really listen to them, they say things like, oh, you know, the deaths are mostly old, sick people. And um, so really what they're saying is it's going to be those people who die, not me. 
or they're saying, well, you know, like Jesse Waters, who's one of Bill O'Reilly's oh. protégés at Fox, right? Oh. Who said, oh, I've got a good attitude. It's power of positive thinking. If I get COVID, I'll be fine, which is basically a way of saying all you poor, weak, frail people who couldn't lick it, it's your fault that you couldn't beat it, which is sick, right? But here's what's deep. If I'm willing to take an action, in this case, reopening everything, ending the sheltering in place orders, that I know is going to kill people, but not me. If it was, if I thought it was going to kill me, I'd be suicidal. Right. If I thought it was going to kill me, I'd be a member of People's Temple lining up to drink the Kool Aid. But if I'm willing to take an action that I know is going to kill somebody, namely you, I'm not suicidal. I'm homicidal. That is not a suicide note. That is a murder. That is a hit, a professional murder hit that the president of the United States is taking out on others. When he says, let's keep the meatpacking plants open because he can't do without burgers and bacon for a day or two, right? Want to keep the meatpacking plants open. It's an essential service. He's saying those people, disproportionately brown-skinned immigrants who work in those facilities, you can just die. And by the way, if you do die, we're going to let your companies off the hook. We're going to take away liability so your families can't sue them. That's not suicide. That's not Jim Jones followers taking the Kool-Aid. That's Jim Jones followers going out into Guyana, where Jonestown was set up, and making the locals drink the Kool-Aid. That's an entirely different scenario. Right, right. You say, surely we don't think it's coincidental that the push for reopening is mostly led by white people, while people of color doing the disproportionate dying, do we? I mean, I think a lot of people are making this point that if um, that the people who are uh, dying are living in nursing homes or they're disproportionately people of color. They're on the front lines in terms of working. And you mentioned the meatpacking right. districts. And that's part of why, I mean, you've already said this, but why some people are okay with going back because it doesn't have to be them. And a lot of people have enough savings to last a little bit, a little bit longer. And certainly uh, disproportionately people of color might not, or just poor people right. in general being, you know, made grist. This is yeah. really the problem. That's why people are ready to go back to work because they don't necessarily have to. Right. And and let's be real clear. Like, it's not just racism. If, if it's classism, it's ableism, it's ageism, right? If this disease, and I, I'm, I've got a piece that'll go out tomorrow that talks about this. If this were a virus that disproportionately affected white, upper middle class, prime of their life in terms of age and healthier people we would be do we nobody would be out there screaming and yelling to go back to work they would be pushing for rent forgiveness mortgage freezes they'd be pushing for what denmark is doing which is basically writing checks to people to get them through the crisis basically what denmark did is they nationalized payroll they said we're going to pay everybody to stay home to get on the other side of this we would do that if the people dying were the opposite of who's dying now but we won't do it with the people who are dying now because at our root, we don't really value their lives as much. And so so what does that tell us? It tells us that there is a virus in the country that isn't just COVID-19. It's the virus of white supremacy, class supremacy, uh, of the affluent. It's, it's, it's able-bodied supremacy. It's, it's ageism and supremacy vis-a-vis -vis older folks. And what it really tells you is that when you take all those folks whose lives aren't valued as much, older folks – Poor folks and working class folks, people of color and people with disabilities or other health conditions or pre-existing health, put them all together. That's the majority of Americans. So really, we ought to be seeing uh, those white folks who normally don't care maybe enough about racism to get animated in the case of like the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. Let's just be clear. I hope you never get sick. I hope you don't get old. Because if you get sick or you get old or you lose your job, somebody out there is going to decide you don't count as much. So maybe it's time to challenge this mentality now because one of these days it's going to come and bite you on the ass. Yeah, so you can't really say there's certain life that's not worthy of, of living and then expect that you're never going to be in that category unless you've got a fountain of youth and you and you drink enough smoothies to never get it. <laughs> right? It's going to find you. So it's time to demand a different set of values. Yeah, you uh, rightfully say that the virus is white supremacy and there's no vaccine for that. Uh, before I let you go, um, you know, I think it's important to, to talk about how we evolve. All of us can. Not everybody does, but evolve. And you could be a, a hardcore uh, racist or sexist person. And then. Any number of circumstances occurs, relationships, meeting new people, and you evolve. I think often of uh, of Senator Byrd, who was like Klan and mm -hmm. then uh, did a lot to try to change all of that and denounced his, his former uh, beliefs. I want to ask you about Joe Biden. 
In the past, yeah. he has supported some pretty uh, awful policies, criminal justice policies. He said some things. Um, a lot of people say he wasn't hard enough on, on Clarence Thomas. I don't know if that has to do with race, but it certainly does have to do with gender and sexism. Yeah. Um, sure. Do you think, you know, but but Barack Obama picked him to be his, be his uh, VP, but that doesn't mean he still can't be racist. I mean, racist right. people are happy to work for powerful people of color if it's a good job. Uh, you can be a racist person, have a lot of black friends, et cetera. Do you right. think Joe Biden, does he strike you at this point in his life and what he's accomplished and working for Obama? Do you, do, would you consider him to be racist at this point? Well, look, he... He's a white person in the United States of America raised and nurtured on racism. So the easy answer is yes, sort of like the Avenue Q musical. You know, we're all a little bit racist, though. So, so to make that statement and end there would not be adequate. Now, back when the primaries were, were going on early on, um, I actually wrote a piece that's also on Medium. It's an open letter to Joe Biden. Uh, and it had to do with his confrontation with Kamala Harris around busing. And, yeah. um, and I was much more on her side of that. I know a lot of people ended up getting on her about it because they felt like busing such an antiquated issue. And why are you even bringing it up? But but she was speaking to a really important history where I think Joe Biden dropped the ball. And I wrote this open letter to Biden at the time, really challenging him around that and 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 really juxtaposing that Joe Biden with the Joe Biden who I actually found something amazing about when I was a young man, I've never, I rarely have told this story, but one of the very first things that actually brought me into sort of political awareness at a really high level, and especially around race uh, in some ways, was during the debates on apartheid in South Africa, during the debates for divestment and sanctions, U.S. sanctions on, on apartheid South Africa. In 1986, it was right before, I think it was, I'm going to say it was the summer of 86, it was right before I went off to college, there was a hearing, um, a Senate hearing that Joe Biden was chairing, or he was one of the main people. And George Shultz, who was the Secretary of State at that time, was brought in to defend the Reagan administration's policies with regard to apartheid in South Africa. And those policies were terrible, and I already knew they were awful, but I'd never really, I hadn't really delved deeply into them. Um, and I'm watching Joe Biden cross examine, really, in a lot of ways, George Shultz on C SPAN. And C-SPAN is not known for being riveting. I mean, that's not a word you would normally use. <laughs> right. But I'm sitting there watching Joe Biden, and he is destroying George Schultz. And he is the passion and the, and the insight that he brought to his condemnation of white supremacy in South Africa was one of the most amazing things that I had ever seen from an American politician or political figure. And I was transfixed by it. So imagine my disappointment when I years later came to understand how little of that passion he seemed to have brought to segregation in his own country, right? He seemed much more animated about the horrors of white supremacy in South Africa than he did in the United States. And so my open letter to him was just like, you know, can we see some more of that Joe Biden? And I actually embed the C-SPAN clip in that piece so you people can watch it. It is available. Um, because that Joe Biden, that sort of ethical, moral core Joe Biden, right, which is a core that I think we all have, but sometimes it gets covered up by all these layers of other bullshit. And I think we need people who can go back and find that. And unfortunately, years later, Joe Biden sort of apologized for being too rude to George Schultz. I'm like, why, why the hell are you apologizing? Like, uh. this guy deserved everything you gave him and more. So I wish we could see more of that because I think Joe Biden has a lot of growth to do, certainly uh, in a lot of different areas. Um, but and his age is no excuse for not continuing to grow. Right. I think we continue to grow until we die. But um, but, you know, I think that he clearly uh, it should not be presumed to be free of this just because Barack Obama made him vice president of the United States. It's still very much an issue for him, just like it is for all of us. Well said. I'll have to go back and uh, and take a look at that piece. I never I never heard about that video clip. Uh, that's interesting. All right, uh, Tim, as always, I really appreciate you joining me. Check out Tim's website, speakoutnow.org. You can support him on Patreon as well. Listen to his commentary there. And um, he's uh, always been a good friend to me and joining me on this show, especially even on a, on a Sunday. Tim, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Awesome as always. Thank you, man. Speakoutnow.org. That's Tim's website, speakoutnow.org, at Tim Jacob Wise on Twitter. You know, I went back and looked up that piece on Medium, and I've got it linked in the show notes. An open letter to Joe Biden on integration, busing, and what he still doesn't understand. Tim posted that back in July of 2019. And here is a clip from that summer of 1986, July 1986, 
with Joe Biden on C-SPAN, where he is really giving the business to then Reagan Secretary of State George Shultz for the Reagan administration's unconscionable soft peddling of South African apartheid, as Tim writes it at Medium. Here's a quick soundbite from that clip. What disturbs me more than the policy that you call a policy is the rationale for the policy. The rationale for the policy. You set out four principles that you, that you adhere to, and then you, and, and I will go over them in a moment. Then you say in page 14, we must not become part of South Africa's problem. We must remain part of their solution. We must not aim to impose ourselves, our solutions, our favorites in South Africa. Damn it, we have favorites in South Africa. The favorites in South Africa are the people who are being repressed by that ugly white regime. We have favorites. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black, and they are being excoriated. It is not to some stupid puppet government over there. It is not to the Afrikaners regime. We have no loyalty to them. We have no loyalty to South Africa, to South Africans. And the fact of the matter is we, I mean, I listen to this rationale, first of all. It is the leaders of South Africa and their people, black and white, who have the majority responsibility. They must rise to it. Well, they are rising to it. They're rising to it. The only thing left available to do with that repulsive, repugnant regime of Afrikaners there. And it's the only way they have. They've tried everything for the last 20 years. They begged, they borrowed, they crawled. And now they're taking up arms. The second thing... Progress toward peace requires a timetable. Timetable, elimination of a part. What's our timetable? What are we saying to that repugnant regime? Are we saying you've got 20 days, 20 months, 20 years? We ask them to put up a timetable. What's our timetable? Where do we stand morally? And then Senator Joe Biden went on and on against George Shultz. It really is as riveting as Tim Wise described it. I highly recommend it. Go read Tim's piece and watch that clip that's embedded in it. Okay, finally for today's episode, I reached out to, as I do almost every week, Boston Globe columnist, one of my favorite progressive columnists, Michael Cohen, always thoughtful. He's got a newsletter. He's written a couple of books. And of course, He's got his column at the Boston Globe, which you should subscribe to. Unfortunately, his name is Michael Cohen. Never going to hear the end of that. At SpeechBoy71. So good on Twitter. Here's this week's conversation with him right now. All right. He joins me now from the Boston Globe. And you should be following him on Twitter at SpeechBoy71. Reading his weekly email. Love when we get to talk to the great Michael Cohen. The Michael Cohen. The real one. (laughs) <laughs> and not the one in jail. Not the one. Is he still in jail? He is still in jail. He's supposed to get out this week, but our last week. But I think he got some for some reason there was some. He wasn't. He wasn't uh, released. So he's still there. We don't care about the people in jail. We think about uh, the folks in the nursing homes, of course, because they did nothing wrong and they're dying at alarming rates. But there are epidemics breaking out uh, in prisons all over the country, and uh, there's there's been very little being done is my understanding. I'm sure some prisons are doing better than others, some states better than others, but from what I've heard, Michael, the country certainly doesn't care about the folks that are incarcerated. Have you no, read anything? Don't. And I just want to go back and say, because a second ago you said people who, you know, who are in uh, prison, you, I mean, people, many of people, obviously in prison have committed crime and found guilty. People in jail uh, have not. Uh, many of them have not. Uh, many Good of them point are waiting to make the, trial yeah. uh, and are considered innocent until proven guilty. And they are now, their lives are being, helped, being put at risk uh, because they're not being uh, separated and they're not having uh, social distancing and, and they're not being released. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a big difference there between jail and prison. It's being charged with something but not being uh, or being held without being charged, right? The whole issue uh, regarding bail and so on. Yeah, it's a really good point. You have uh, written a piece earlier this week, last week rather, uh, titled You Are an American Hero, giving credit to those of us who are following the rules, although you're not talking about my wife and daughters who on Mother's Day we all went to the park, but I was the only one wearing a mask, Michael. Really? Uh, I'd like went, to have a talk with uh, with your family about that. <laughs> uh, went for a walk in the park. Uh, my wife's like, we're outside, and uh, I just I can't anymore. So I decided not to argue with her, but I but I held up the right example for my kids. Uh, that's good. Uh, look, I, I I get it. It's hard. And you know, a couple of days ago when it was like really humid out, uh, I wore a mask and my glasses were fogging up, and I had to take it down and put it down on my chin. But, you know, I see people doing it today, beautiful day in the park. 
I see people not wearing masks and I just kind of, I don't know, just wear a mask. It's not that hard. Keep, keep, keep people safe. It's what keeps you safe. It's what keeps people around you safe. Uh, it's the best way possible to get life back to normal is to do a very simple thing and wear a mask when you're outside. I do it. I've been doing it for two months now. My kids do it. Uh, I'm pretty vigilant about it. And I just, you know, I, I, just, I guess I'm a little bit, fr- I, I don't want to put that on your family, but I feel a little frustrated because I feel like I'm doing a lot. And most people I think are doing what they're supposed to be doing, playing by the rules uh, and are sacrificing, you know, for the greater good. And then you have some people who, and again, I mean, I'm not, people I'm concerned about really are people who are out demonstrating at state capitals who are out complaining about how the freedom is being taken away because they have to wear a mask. They can't go to the store. This idiot conservative on Twitter who completely couldn't buy a toaster the other day. Do you see this guy? No. What is this? This guy, Todd Starnes, who complained that he went to the, went to department store and he had to, you know, he had to wear a mask and he had to use hand sanitizer and he had to get in line. And all I want to do is buy a toaster. He didn't get his toaster. I'm like, you know, Guys who landed at, at Normandy are like you're grieving over your inability to buy a toaster. Uh, no, but I, what I, I'm trying to get in here is that most people are doing the right thing, but a small second population refuses to do the right thing, complains about doing the right thing, uh, whines about it, and they're the ones who are holding back any kind of progress on on beating back this this uh, this this awful virus. You know, and so that's the thing that I think this this inflames me. And I think we have to you know not just criticize those people, which we should. But let's praise all the people out there who are doing the right thing, because the vast majority of people that I talk to, people that I know and I see in the street are doing the right thing. And they deserve a little bit of praise for it, because you know what? That's a sacrifice. Staying at home, wearing a mask, wearing gloves, doing whatever. That's a sacrifice. And we're all making it. Not all of us. Most of us are making, I should say. I went to the grocery store this evening to buy a couple of items for Mother's Day dinner, and there was a sign in front that said, COVID-19 update, all customers must wear a mask. And it was interesting because basically what they're saying is this is these are our rules. If you want to be out, if you want to come into the store, you have to wear a mask. If you want to complain, if you want to resist, if you don't want to listen, fine. But you can't come into our store. And it's interesting to see that these are the rules that are going to be set up by, in this case, a grocery store. In other cases, it'll be restaurants. So you can complain all you want, but if you're not going to follow the rules, you're not going to be welcome into stores exactly. and eventually uh, probably schools and other places. That's just going to be the way it will be. And then the what are you going to do? Be. And the way it should be, frankly. I mean, what are you going to protest and not wear a mask? And then some people are. And I mean, and you're and, and do stores want to be in a situation of have they have to tell tell customers if you put a, you put a mask on, you have to leave. I mean, the thing that I think it's tough a little bit right now is that it's hard to sort of say to people, to sit, you know, I saw this, uh, the uh, mayor of Providence said you should shame people who aren't wearing masks. And, uh, you know, I got to get the, I get where he's coming from a little bit, but like, I'm not going to go out there and like tell people you have to wear a mask. I mean, you know, it, it's just not, I, I don't, I don't, I, I guess maybe I, maybe I should do that, but I feel like that's just a lot, a lot to ask of an ordinary uh, individual American to go out there and tell people they don't know strangers, you got to wear your mask. I'll tell my friends and family. I'll tell people I see who I know, like, why aren't you wearing a mask? But I certainly wouldn't say to some stranger. Uh, and even though it, it annoys the hell out of me when I see it, like uh, when I see people, you know, in my neighborhood who should be wearing one and they're not, you know, or, or who are walking, uh, this is something that kills me, walking out the middle of the sidewalk, you know, making me walk all the way to the side because they're not wearing a mask. You know, I think that's the thing that, that it's, but at the same time, it's like, it's not my, I don't the burden you place on, on us to, to correct their behavior. They should do the right thing. Isn't part of the problem, however, and it's a really interesting example of, of this country and our society that it, you're not really wearing the mask to protect yourself as much as you are to protect other people. It's not really entirely about you. I mean, that's uh, that's my wife's argument. I hate to throw her under the bus again here on the podcast, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just not really about you. It's about others. It is. It's, I mean, it's a little bit about you, but it's primarily about others. You're right. Cause if you're asymptomatic and you're out, you know, breathing and coughing and sneezing, you're going to get other people sick. Uh, you know, and it's a, and it, to me, it's like, I don't really enjoy wearing a mask, but I've gotten sort of used to it by now. And I just feel like it's a small price to pay to keep people from getting sick. I really do. That's how I, I, mean, I feel. I mean, a really small price to pay. I am not, I mean, I said everyone's a hero and I kind of, that was the idea of the piece, but, I feel like, you know, the real heroes obviously 
are the people who are in the, in, in the hospitals, the nurses and the doctors and the, and the hospital workers and people who are grocery stores, people who are transit workers and people who are, who are actually putting themselves in harm's way. I think all of us are doing a small part that is really crucial. Uh, but I mean, we're not, we're not doing what those people are doing, obviously. You so know, we can uh, do this small thing because you know what? It's manageable. We can all handle it. Yeah, I completely agree. Also, I think for you, Michael, uh, you your best half has always been the nose up. Just saying. I mean, your your eyes and your hair are really great. Um, so dude, uh, and that's dude, my forehead. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. It's gorgeous, I know you should. Right? It's gorgeous. Should take out an ad on that, and I can tell you exactly <laughs> where to go. So. <laughs> it's crazy. We're no, it's running funny. around wearing. No, you should go into comedy. That's a around. good thing for you. I well, running you. around wearing masks. I got. I too, have, you know, got glasses on and they fog up. Who's going to invent the mask or the glasses that don't fog up? Somebody's yeah. got to jump on that before it's yeah, too late. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, why are you going? What can you? Uh, I read this tweet of yours quoting uh, something about Glenn Greenwald. What? What's the deal? What you wrote? He is exactly who he thought. Uh, who we thought he was. What's up with the, with Glenn so that, Greenwald? That was like a tweet about where he was defending uh, a couple of like uh, right wing uh, uh, journalists, uh, Chuck were- Ross, Daily Caller, and Molly Hemingway, um, who are pretty consistently dishonest Trump enablers. Hmm. And he basically took the argument, the position that, you know, they, they were telling the truth about the Russia Gate stuff and all the, the journalists on MS, MSNBC. They were all lying uh, about Russiagate. And, you know, Greenwald sort of taking this, this view now that the whole Russia story, as the president has, by the way, was a hoax and that he was exonerated and that there was nothing to it. Um, you know, that's just that just kind of proves what many of us said about Glenn Greenwald for a long time, that he's not an honest broker, that he's got an agenda, uh, that he certainly isn't a progressive or a liberal. That's for darn sure. Uh, and he's somebody who, you know, uh, has, a, I, I hate to say this, has like some pretty upsetting and pretty troubling impulses as far as um, almost quasi-authoritarian in some respects, I think. Mm. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's too strong, actually. That's too strong. Okay. I, I take that back. Not quasi-authoritarian. I think what his thing is that he is a guy who basically doesn't like liberals, doesn't like Democrats. Uh, wants everyone to sort of think like he does or be like he does. And if they don't, then he just, you know, bullies them and attacks them. And the reason, the reason I go after that guy is that he's, he's a bully. Uh, he's a bully and people don't agree with him. And I, and I find that, I don't know, I don't like it. All right, there you go. Uh, I, I, I'm always interested in, in, in seeing uh, the kind of the criticisms of other uh, folks like that. In that case, Glenn Greenwald has got a complex set of beliefs, that's for sure. I never know what to think. Uh, about him. All right. So let me ask you about your uh, your piece this week in the Globe. I think you get, had a couple uh, uh, columns, but this is a really interesting one because you make a a strong case. Uh, Donald Trump is the worst president ever, and he did it all in just one term. You compare him basically with Andrew uh, Jackson and Johnson. Johnson. That's what I, I did not get it wrong. I got it right. Um, I can delete that. Andrew Johnson and George W. Bush. Um, and, you know, when it comes down to it, you look at kind of the loss of life and uh, make the case now here on the show that you did in the Boston Globe that Donald Trump is the worst president ever, even so worse my, than Bush. OK, so my thing in this is that uh, the Andrew Johnson comparison is a little trickier, so I'm not going to get into that too much. I'm going to go more on the Bush thing, because my thing on Bush has always been. Every couple of years, Bush will kind of come out of exile in Texas. You know, he'll have some paintings or he'll go to like some funeral or he'll hang out with Ellen Jenner. And people will be like, eh, you know what? He really wasn't that bad. Yeah. And my response is, no, no, no. He was that bad. He was the worst president. If not, I mean, I don't know if he's as bad as Johnson, but he's certainly in that category of badness. Uh, and Trump, as bad as he has been, you know, really can't, can't quite compare to, to, to George W. Bush because, you know, the Iraq War – the 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 uh, presiding over the meltdown of the U.S. economy, uh, climate change, torture. I mean, doing nothing climate change. I'd say torture. Uh, you know, uh, terrible job growth. Uh, more people uh, uh, losing health insurance. Just a, a whole a whole resume of of crappiness. And yet, Trump, I feel like, with this response to the to COVID nineteen, has surpassed uh, 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 Bush. Primarily, I mean, I hate to say, it, obviously, it's awful to say this, but primarily because of the death toll. Yeah is now 80,000 and almost certainly will be higher and will probably top the number of Americans. I mean, obviously, Americans killed in Iraq was around 4,400, 4,500. 
but our number of Rockies killed was like 100,000. It's almost certainly going to surpass that number. Um, obviously, the U.S. economy has totally melted down, even worse than it was during the Great Recession. So at this point, I think really he, he is the worst president, at least in the 20th century, uh, 20, 21st century, I should say. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, maybe only Johnson really can compare as far as, as, as awfulness. And, and I think, honestly, I think Trump has kind of moved ahead of him. Because I'm also, I did, by the way, did mention impeachment because he wasn't impeached as well. Right, unlike, right. Unlike W. Yeah, you spell it all out in this column, and it's really interesting to read and to see it kind of all there in one place. But obviously the loss of life, you know, you think about a president's tenure or th- their administration in terms of the loss of life and how they may or may not be responsible for that and the economy. So kind of blood and treasure in terms of the economy that they preside over. And obviously Bush presided over the cratering of the United States economy, which was the worst of our lifetime, second to this Right. And, um, you know, you don't you say he's not it's not directly Trump's fault, all of the loss of life because of COVID-19. But certainly it would have it could have been far less worse is the point that you're I making. Think that's the bottom line. I mean, there's no way to look at this right now and not in conclusion. I mean, we have four percent of the world's population and we have about a third of all COVID-19 cases in the world. Twenty six, twenty seven percent of all deaths in the world. And. uh you know, when I look at other countries, like uh, the example, of course, is South Korea, which had its first case the same day as the U.S. did. And now South Korea has about, I don't know, a couple hundred people have died, I believe. Um, certainly nowhere near the 80,000 died here. It's also just that, I mean, we've reached a point now where the administration's position is we don't really, they don't seem to care that people are going to die. Right? Opening up the economy, which is the new mantra, I mean, it's going to kill people literally going to kill people. It already is killing people. Um, and the administration doesn't seem to care at all. Uh, and if that isn't a, a, you know, catastrophically horrible response to a public health emergency, I don't know what is. I don't know how you can compare that. I've never, I, you know, I, I know this president's terrible. I've written for, for five years that he's terrible. But even in my wildest imagination, I could not have pictured a situation in which yeah. him and the people around him would be basically saying, we're okay with 10,000 Americans dying. That's basically where where we are right now as a country. Well, they're certainly not uh, showing any kind of empathy. And it was really kind of, I don't know, I guess it was unprecedented in a way because George W. Bush doesn't say much. But last week he put out a statement just talking about bringing people together and that we got to unify. And it had nothing to, I mean, I don't know, maybe I missed it. Maybe there was some slight uh, reference to Trump, but. There wasn't. So the president, Trump, the current president, went out and attacked George W. Bush for not supporting him. During the uh, during the impeachment hearings, and it was a crazy moment, Michael, to see Trump attacking Bush, well, an ex president, simply for trying to get folks to work together. And this is together. kind of the thing too about why he's a bad president. I mean, that as bad as Bush was, at least you sort of recognize the fact that you know, at a time of national crisis, you got to find a way to bring the country together, right? I mean, I, I have a lot of things I say bad about George W. Bush. One thing I'll say good about George W. Bush is that. You know, in the week or so after 9-11, he went to a mosque in Washington, D.C. and said, you know, this is not, he said, you know, Islam is a, is a religion of love and not a religion of war. And basically, you know, uh, spoke out against xenophobic attitudes toward, toward Muslims right. after 9-11. That's right, he did. Uh, obviously, Trump has not done that, of course. He's done it for five years. He's been, you know, sowing those divisions. But, um, you know, that he can't even master the most basic skill of a president, which is to try to unify the country, which is to try to speak to some kind of sense of shared sacrifice to American ideals. You know, the idea that, that he basically is saying that we don't have to give money to blue states, which is not a talking point among Republicans. Let's give money to blue states because they've mismanaged it. They, they don't deserve to get any money from the federal government. I mean, can you imagine after 9-11, w, George W. Bush saying, it's New York, it's a blue state, they don't get any money. Screw them. No, of course not. He didn't, wouldn't say that. And no one would say that. But now it's like not only is Trump saying it, you can hear like Rick Scott in Florida and, and Martha McSally in Arizona who are basically saying the exact same thing. Stop giving money to New York. To Illinois, like Cruz. New Jersey states that are blue states, uh, they, they, they're going to waste it. I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's beyond disgusting. And, it, you know, you see that there's now, I think you just mentioned it, uh, been uh, positive cases within the White House. People working close to both the vice president and president have now uh, tested positive yeah. and still they don't seem to be making any changes. I mean, I'm not sure how much closer it has to hit to home than actual people working right amongst the president and vice president. But I mean, early next week, he was talking about winding, uh, winding down the task force. And apparently then he decided, Oh, I guess it's very popular. We'll keep it going. 
But yeah, as you said, the mantra now is let's get back to work. And as you point out in your most recent column, I think, or in your newsletter, it's we can't. It's a false choice. And they're going back to work in the states where the numbers are going up. But then some people argue the numbers are only going up because testing is getting better, Michael. Come on. Really? I mean, look, this is a a highly contagious disease that is spread by person to person contact. Okay. Basic logic says that if you open things back up and if you put people in contact with each other when they weren't in contact with each other, that you're going to have more spread of this illness. Okay. That is basic common sense. And I will just say it again, like the example that is being set by red state governors by opening this stuff, this stuff up, by not wearing masks in public, but not pushing people to, to wear masks, but not putting stay in home place orders. They're basically telling people, this isn't that big of a deal. You don't have to worry about it. And I do think that example means a lot. I really think it does. I think, you know, I, I'll be very critical of, of in New York city. You know, I think, I think Mayor de Blasio has been a disaster on this point and took way too long to recognize that he needed to actually be set a good example by saying we need, we need, to, we need to socially distance from each other. It took him too long to do it, and I think a lot of the deaths that have happened here are because he took too long to recognize the severity of the situation. Um, but I, and I think also because he didn't create – he wasn't a role model. He didn't, he didn't make clear to, to people in New York City, you know what? You're going to die if you, get, if, if you don't go home and, and stay in, in, in shelter in place. I think other people, other states have done, other governors, other mayors, done a much better job of explaining to, to, their, to, their, to their citizens why this is important. Yeah, I think the leadership uh, matters so much and it doesn't have to be so partisan uh, and, and, and it doesn't have to. I mean, the idea that we're uh, that there's a campaign for us to open up right now, it is only going to make the economy worse. And it's only going to be potentially that much worse as a result uh, come election time. There's so many uh, people who are commenting, saying that this is all about uh, partisan politics, trying to save the economy so that it doesn't crater to the point where it will have a really negative effect come election time, especially on Republicans, because the incumbent usually takes the blame. Whoever's in office, they're talking about now that they could lose the Senate. But, Michael, my question is, and you've been writing a little bit about this, and obviously paying close attention to it. What about that election? I mean, how legitimate is that election going to be if they're doing everything they can right now to prevent voters from getting ballots that they can mail in? And it might be so bad that we're all scared to go out and vote in person. Well, I think it depends on the state, right? I mean, a lot, I mean, a lot of states you can request a mail ba- a mail in ballot. I mean, you do have states like Georgia. I think I think on Texas where they're basically saying you you have to have an excuse to get a mail in ballot, and they're saying that fear of catching COVID nineteen is not a good enough excuse to no. request a mail in ballot. Mm. You imagine? Yeah. Uh, so I think you're going to have some states where there's going to be real problems, but I think you know most states, it's no excuse mail in ballot, and I think. Uh, in most places, you're gonna you're gonna have I think at least blue states. You're gonna have people trying to trying to do mail in ballots. I also think look look what happened in Wisconsin, man. Wisconsin primary back in April. I yeah. mean, uh, people came out and voted in big numbers, and and they were Democrats. They weren't scared away by the fact they could get sick. They went out and voted. And I think there's something to be said for what happened there, and the desire among Democrats out there to rid this country of Donald Trump. And, and I and I I guess at the end of the day, I mean, I, I'm not making any predictions because I'm out of the fiction business when it comes to politics, but it's hard to look at the current situation and see Trump's path to reelection because, you know, 20 percent unemployment, which is what his own White House aides are predicting, is not the kind of situation in which you get reelected. It really isn't. And, and as, as you said, and I think it's exactly right, opening up too soon actually makes his situation worse. And I find it kind of crazy. Like if they if everyone they said, to, you know, look, give everybody a check, tell everyone not to pay rent, take care of their health care for two months dump money into the, into the economy until tell everyone you got to stay home. Can't leave the house for, you know, the end of May uh, or end of April. It's very possible that we'd be like, you know, on the, on the downward trajectory with COVID-19 cases in this country. And instead we plateaued and probably it's going to go up again when you have more of this, of this opening up happening. We had ways to avoid this and we didn't do it. Of all the polling that matters. And I, I see you uh, quoting this in Twitter and I think this is it. It's it. Do Americans feel safe enough to go out, to be normal. So even if, you know, states open up and if the president of the United States is encouraging people to go back out, so glad America's opening back up. According to the polling, 
it doesn't mean that Americans are going to go out. And exactly. if they do, it doesn't mean that we're going to go exactly. and spend money. So you can encourage us to all you cannot force us to go to stores and restaurants and other places and spend money. You can't do that. And so it's not going to make a difference other than more people getting sick. I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist or an economist, but it would seem that that's going to be the case. As long as most Americans are still afraid to go out and do stuff, they're not going to go out and do stuff no matter what you say. I mean, I'm afraid to go into a grocery store right now. Can you imagine going into a restaurant, eating in a restaurant with other people? Can you imagine going to a, a baseball game? I can't I mean, imagine doing anything that I don't have to do. Y- I mean, yes. I've gone to the hardware store a bunch of times because that I guess I don't have to get the things I'm getting at the hardware store, lumber and, 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 and uh, you know, hardware. But I that's what's keeping me sane, you know, do, working on some of those projects. but. So I don't have to do that. But other than that, just the grocery store. That's it. Grocery and a liquor I, store. I, I went to Target about three weeks ago, and I thought I was going to have an anxiety attack from being inside. I mean, and I'm not an anxious person. I'm not a scared person. I'm yeah. not by any means. But, like, being in Target was, like, anxiety-inducing, you know? Because you're, like, everyone's fuck, everyone's around you, and you're, like, worried about everyone, everyone's going to give you this, 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 this terrible virus. Weren't you uh, there just to buy a poster board to stand in the corner to shame people not wearing masks? Yeah, if, if the truth, if, I have to be honest about it. Yeah, that's the reason. Bunch of signs and a mask. I bought some glitter glue too to like. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Yeah, you, you don't want to be too mean. At least it's yeah. fun to look at. So no. I mean, the bottom line is, we, uh, my point is, you, there's nothing you can do to save the economy if people aren't going to go out and spend money. And if people are afraid of getting sick, if they're yeah. afraid that like you know being in crowds can get them sick, they're not going to do it. And I don't care. Right. I don't care how many times Trump says it. It's just not gonna. It's not gonna happen. Michael Cohen, uh, I think you're right about this, as I usually do uh, about you think you are about most things. Uh, read his piece, read his column at the Boston Globe, subscribe to the Boston Globe, subscribe to his newsletter, follow him on Twitter, get his books. And well, buy uh, the book, definitely. definitely. Yeah, buy, buy, the, uh, buy the books, uh, uh, both of your most recent books. Michael, thank you as always for joining me. Appreciate it. And I will talk to you hopefully next week. Uh, hope so. Always a pleasure. There you go. My conversation with Boston Globe columnist Michael Cohen on Twitter at SpeechBoy71. As that is all we've got, I've got for today's show. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Stay close, stay connected. You are not alone in what you're going through. That I can promise you. I'm here for you. Reach out anytime you want, and I hope to talk to you real soon. Offline, online, in line, while wearing a mask. I love you. Bye-bye.